Today on Newswatch, Clinton and Trump each on damage control. We'll break down what the presidential candidates are working to clean up. Plus, a health warning for millions of Americans. What you need to know about the dangers of a common type of pain medicine. And an illiterate underdog who rose from the slums to become a chess champion. See how God transformed her life in this true story now in theaters. Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Caitlin Burke. Donald Trump is dealing with the fallout from the New York Times story exposing his tax returns. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton is doing damage control herself after the release of an audio tape where she insults Bernie Sanders supporters. Dale Hurd has the story. The New York Times says an anonymous tipster sent them Trump's 1995 tax returns, which show a $916 million loss a number large enough that the Times says Trump could legally have paid no federal taxes for up to 18 years. Trump's team calls it genius. No one who's shown more genius in, in their way to maneuver around the tax code and to rightfully use the laws to do that. This is a perfectly legal application of the tax code. Don't you think a man who has this kind of economic genius is a lot better yes. for the United States than a, a woman? And the only thing she's ever produced uh, there's a lot of work for the FBI uh, checking out our emails. Hillary Clinton's campaign says Trump's tax return reveals the colossal nature of his past business failures. Clinton ally Bernie Sanders called it an assault on the American people. If Mr. Giuliani thinks that Mr. Trump is smart and all the rest of us are dummies, well, I think they have a very distorted view of the American people and what this country is about. But the website Zero Hedge points out that Bill and Hillary Clinton used the same tax avoidance loophole, reporting a $700,000 loss to avoid paying taxes in 2015. And Clinton has fresh problems of her own. On a leaked fundraising recording, Clinton referred to Bernie Sanders supporters as basement dwellers. They're children of the Great Recession, and they are living in their parents' basement. Bernie Sanders acknowledged Sunday that he was upset by Clinton's words and said their two campaigns still have real differences. Meanwhile, Trump dialed up the attacks on Hillary Clinton's physical and mental health and whether she has been faithful to Bill Clinton. She could be crazy. She could actually be crazy. I don't even think she's loyal to Bill. She should be in prison. The Clinton campaign called the new attacks particularly unhinged. Clinton was in Charlotte speaking on America's racial divide. We can call for reforms to policing while still appreciating the many courageous and admirable officers out there. Dale Hurd, CBN News. A potential cyber threat is casting a shadow over the upcoming election. Hackers believed to be tied to Russia have reportedly targeted the voter registration computers of at least 20 states. We are doing an awful lot of work through our counterintelligence investigators to understand just what mischief uh, is Russia up to in connection with our election. 21 states have now requested help in blocking cyber attacks. One main concern is that this threat will undermine voter confidence in the results of the November election. Today, Haiti braces for what's expected to be a catastrophic Category 4 hurricane. Hurricane Matthew is heading toward the island nation with winds up to 130 miles per hour. The storm also poses danger to eastern Cuba and Jamaica. Forecasters say Matthew is the strongest storm to hit the Atlantic since Hurricane Felix in 2007. It's still unclear what impact the hurricane will have directly on the U.S. Pastors across America came together Sunday to fight a piece of legislation called the Johnson Amendment. That limits where they're allowed to, what they're allowed to say about politics from the pulpit. Conservative group Alliance Defending Freedom held an event called Pulpit Freedom Sunday. The group is fighting for a new bill that would address the speech restrictions imposed by the Johnson Amendment. Churches currently risk their tax-exempt status if they speak out about a political campaign. So far, 4,100 pastors have signed up for the protest. Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore is suspended from office for the remainder of his term. That's because of an order he issued banning same-sex marriage in Alabama after the U.S. Supreme Court legalized the practice last year. The Alabama Judicial Inquiry Commission filed ethics charges against Moore, claiming he abused power and disrespected the judici judiciary. 
When his term expires, he'll be ineligible to run for election as judge again because of his age. People who take a common type of pain reliever called NSAIDs are at an increased risk of heart failure. Those findings from new research. As Lori Johnson tells us, this is the latest red flag about these drugs. Robert Carnes is one of millions who takes an NSAID for achy joints, sinus pressure, or other types of pain. NSAID is short for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. NSAIDs include naproxen like Aleve, ibuprofen like Motrin and Advil, and aspirin. NSAIDs also come in prescription strength doses, and those doses are what the study looked into. A study of 10 million people shows the use of prescription NSAIDs increases the risk of heart failure by 20 percent. The risk increases with the amount of NSAIDs a person takes, up to 50 percent for people who take very high doses. One of the authors of the study said our findings, which focused only on prescription NSAIDs, might apply to over-the-counter NSAIDs as well. Although over-the-counter NSAIDs are typically used at lower doses and for shorter durations, they are sometimes available at the same doses as prescription NSAIDs and they may be inappropriately overused. This is just the latest of many warnings about NSAIDs. Previous research revealed they are responsible for 16,000 deaths each year and 100,000 hospitalizations from things like kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and ulcers. That was Robert's problem. NSAIDs led to his painful ulcers. That surprised me. Uh, I had no clue. Gastroenterologist Daniel Newman says he sees a lot of patients with serious intestinal bleeding brought on by taking NSAIDs. He says you should be concerned if you develop a change in the color of your stool, black, tarry bowel movements, you start to have uh, vomiting or nausea, you're throwing up stuff that looks like coffee, black coffee ground like material. Even in the absence of pain, this could be a sign of intestinal bleeding. Despite the risks associated with NSAIDs, patients should talk to their doctor before they quit using them because they do perform the important function of reducing inflammation. But you can often do that just by switching to an anti-inflammatory diet one high in fresh vegetables and healthy fats, but low in sugar, carbohydrates, and processed foods. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Coming up, the amazing story of a world-class chess champion, her rise to success from the most unlikely spot on earth. What's your favorite underdog story? Is it Rudy or maybe Rocky? Now you're about to see one that outshines them all. It begins thousands of miles away, in the last place you'd think to find a champion. And it's the subject of a new movie that just hit theaters this weekend. Wes Rickards brings us the extraordinary true story of the Queen of Cotway. To be African is to be an underdog in the world. To be Ugandan is to be an underdog in Africa. To be from Katwe is to be an underdog in Uganda. To be a girl is to be an underdog in Katwe. Located in the shadows of the Ugandan capital of Kampala, Katwe is, in all sense of the word, a slum. It's a place where refugees were shooed because no one else wanted to live there. The place is a literal sewer. Crime is rampant, as is drug use and prostitution. Half of all teenage women are mothers. They say if you're born in Katwe, you die in Katwe. Life in Katwe is very challenging, I would say, because the people who actually live in Katwe are people who have no choice. If they had a choice, they can't be in Katwe. And it's the only area that they can afford to be in. Sometimes it's hard even to explain how people really stay there. Every day at 6 a.m., Robert Katende arrives here, a rundown structure that doesn't look too out of place here in Katwe. The building is called Agape Church, 
which is part of a U.S.-based ministry called Sports Outreach. Katende is the ministry director here. I very much believe that, more especially when it comes to the children and the youth, everyone loves to play, for sure. But many times, people are not given the opportunity. And some of these children always don't have a chance to even play because they are always struggling to survive. As you can imagine, sports is heavy on the agenda here. The boys take quickly to soccer and dozens of children show up every morning. Many of them don't go to school. Some are orphans. Few are homeless. All looking for guidance in their own way. So when they come, the first thing is to try to show that you really care for them. You are there for them. You play together. You encourage. So eventually they get to bond with you and then you're able to direct them to some other life they have never seen. While soccer is popular, there are drawbacks. It can be fast, it can be violent. So not everyone joins in. Robert noticed that and started thinking of other ways to get everyone involved. Finally, he thought of a board game so foreign, there's not even a word for it in his native language. Robert was gonna teach this game to a bunch of kids who didn't even know how to read. Whatever you go through on that board actually is what we go through in our daily life. It requires strategy, it requires abstractive thinking, it requires concentration, focus, time management, everything, talk about any concept. We need it in our life. And one day, while talking to slum kids about pawns and rooks and kings, Robert noticed something, a nine-year-old girl in a window. The first day, I just took her like any other child. In fact, when she came, my first question was, how will she feel at home? To say Fiona Mutes was a nine-year-old might be a bit of a misnomer. The truth is, no one knows how old she was. We know that she was born in Cotway. We know her father died when she was about three, possibly due to AIDS. And we know when she first appeared in the window, she had just walked several miles and was only looking for something to eat. So that day, I remember I was very, very dirty. And I was always very, very hungry. So my brother came and told me about the HS program they always had. So that day I was able to learn chess and again even to get a meal. Now, chess isn't an easy game to pick up. And when Fiona first started playing, she lost a lot. But she still kept playing. There was a boy who used to beat me every day. So one time I went to coach Robert and he taught me how to defend that opening. So I went back to play this boy. When I played him, I happened to win him and he cried. From that day, that's when I said, I have to beat every boy. And within that short time she had been in the program, I realized that there is something special with this girl. Like you could teach her something and she could easily pick it up. What makes Fiona great, though, is that she has something that can't be taught. It's this instinct, this ability to see the right move many moves in advance, knowing that the wrong move could mean death. That's a lesson she learned growing up in Cotway. Sometimes the environment they stay in teaches them to be very aggressive because the life there is more like survival of the fittest. And uh, she was almost more playing the same way. So it was just to calm her down. Not every time that it's going to be attacking. You need to strategize. You need to plan well. Get your pieces ready for that attack. Within a year, Fiona was beating the boys at Agape Church, including Coach Robert. Soon she was visiting boarding schools and beating the kids there. Then she played university players and whipped them too. In 2007, 11-year-old Fiona Mutes won Uganda's junior championships and the national championships just a few years after that. We shall live together. We shall live together. We shall live together someday. Fiona Mutes is a Christian. It's a faith she learned at the sports outreach mission, and it's one that's helped her survive in Cotway. When I went to this program, I was not a Christian before. I stayed there and I listened to the story. It was so interesting, so I kept on like remaining every day for the stories. In 2010, 14-year-old Fiona flew to Siberia with Uganda's national team for the world's most prestigious tournament, the Chess Olympiad. It marked only the second time she had left the country, 
and it became the first time the world laid its eyes on the young chess prodigy. There are many things which have happened to me which I can't believe. Before I, before I joined chess, I was living just in the slum and I thought everyone lived that kind of life. The morning after she flew back to Uganda, Fiona returned home to a hero's welcome. And soon, they came calling. The writers, the reporters. Her story has been told by CNN, ESPN, and there's a book about her life. She's toured America, spoken to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, met Gary Kasparov. Disney is making a movie about her life. Her future is bright. Sometimes I feel like I'm overwhelmed. It overwhelms me, because it doesn't matter what I've passed through, because whatever I've passed through, it's already gone now. I'm looking forward to my future. Chess is her ticket out. From the slums, from the 10 by 10 hut she calls home that she shares with her mother and siblings. And if she can escape, she can lead others to follow her path. I feel she's a source of hope. Many children go through the same life she's been in. But I think seeing her breaking that chain, I think it's more like an inspirational story for them. And I've always encouraged the children, tell them no excuses in that whatsoever. With God, everything is possible. The sky is the limit. To be African is to be an underdog in the world. To be Ugandan is to be an underdog in Africa. To be from Katwe is to be an underdog in Uganda. And to be a girl is to be an underdog in Katwe. And yet, in Katwe, the unlikeliest place of all, the queen stands tall. Up next, giving back to a soldier who served his country for 18 years. CBN says thank you to an American hero. After nine tours of duty in the Army, Zevin was ready to do even more. But when the Army discharged him unexpectedly, he was out of work with no way to support his family. That's when CBN's Helping the Home Front stepped in. Take a look. While the nation follows the Middle East conflict on network news, Army Master Sergeant Zavon has lived it. In his 18 years of military service, he's deployed nine times to war zones, each tour lasting six to 12 months. It's an honor for me. It's an honor to do what I've done, and I'm, I'm very thankful for what it's done for my family and, and, and how it's changed my life, going from a boy to a man. Zavon's biggest supporters are those he leaves behind, wife Ashley and his five kids. Thinking about what he does over there has helped me to realize how much we take for granted. And I feel completely secure with him. I feel equally impressed and proud of her for what she's done to support me through all that. It's humbling to hear her say she's proud of me when I know that I couldn't have done it without her. Zavon was planning on re-enlisting, but due to troop downsizing, the Army declined his request. He received an honorable discharge, but only had a few months to transition to civilian life and find a job. The couple trusted that God would see them through. Having faith that this is all God's plan and He'll take care of us is probably why we're not going as crazy as we would be. Just outside Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the couple attends a Christian military support group called Force Ministries. Force heard about helping the home front and asked CBN to get involved. Force Executive Director Greg Wark sat down with the couple to tell them the news. Helping the home front has decided to help you with this transition by providing you guys with three months of mortgage payments. I thank you so much to think that we're worthy of doing something like that for us. I thank God that he uh, allowed this moment and allowed us this opportunity. We're very grateful for, for stepping in and for CBN stepping in and um, gifting us this. Now this family can transition into civilian life with a little less stress. I think it's a great program, and I hope it continues to help a lot of other soldiers and their families. And we thank you so much. It's, it's a huge burden that, that is lifted off our shoulders. You can find more stories of how CBN is helping military families on the home front at CBN.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. 
All eyes are on the vice presidential candidates as they prefer, prepare to face off in their first and only debate. This lone debate is also putting one lucky town on the political map, and it happens to be the hometown of yours truly. New York, St. Louis, Las Vegas. They're all sites for the 2016 presidential debates. But the VP debate is a different story. For that one, the Commission on Presidential Debates made an unlikely choice. Farmville. No, not that Farmville you see on Facebook. This Farmville in Virginia. It's located in the central part of the Old Dominion, about an hour drive from the state capitol. Population, 8,000. The candidates will square off at Farmville's Longwood University. Why was it chosen? We don't actually know, but we do know Farmville is rich in history. The town played a major role during the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement. It's also where CBN reporter Caitlin Burke grew up. Farmville was a great place to grow up. It's just a small college town. I had a great church family, great friends. I think between my dad's connections as a small business owner and my own school friends, I probably knew most of the town. Locals are thrilled all eyes will be on their town. They're also looking forward to the $10 million bills the debate is expected to attract. I'm Jennifer Wishon, and I'll be there. That's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care about most at CBNNews.com. And tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do that on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.